Philip II of Macedonia is someone whose memory has nearly been lost to the sands of time. Unless you're a history buff, it's unlikely you've heard of him. This is despite the incredible impact he had on the ancient world. In this video, the first of two parts, we'll delve into the life of this fascinating figure and examine why he deserves recognition as one of the most influential people of his time. Philip was truly a visionary. He was born into a world of chaos and turmoil, but during his reign he brought stability and prosperity to Macedonia. He was the one who laid the foundation for Alexander the Great to conquer the known world. Despite the challenges, Philip's father Amantas III held on to the crown for a relatively long time, though at the cost of conceding power to outside forces and leaving Macedonia weakened. After Amantas' passing, Philip's oldest brother took the throne as Alexander II at just 18, while Philip was 12 years old. In 371, the city-state of Thebes defeated mighty Sparta at the Battle of Leuctra, which resulted in the Theban hegemony, a period of about 10 years where Thebes was the most powerful state in Greece. Hegemonic Thebes and Macedon were both competing for influence in Thessaly, but the Macedonians had to concede that they were not a match for them. In 369, the Theban general Pelopidas imposed peace on Macedonia and the warring states of Thessaly. Philip and 30 noble Macedonian offspring were taken captive and sent to Thebes as hostages, serving as bargaining chips in this fragile peace treaty. Philip's formative years then were spent in the cultured city of Thebes as a guest of Pamenes, a prominent and influential aristocrat. Despite being a captive, he was treated with warmth and hospitality. Pamenes was friends with the greatest military commander of the age, Epaminondas. It was he and another man named Pelopidas who brought his people to the heights of glory. Epaminondas was a devout follower of Pythagorean philosophy. He was known for his serious demeanor and interest in numbers and formulae, as well as his refusal to consume meat or participate in animal sacrifice. It's only natural to assume that Philip had absorbed some of the cutting-edge military tactics that he would later deploy as king of Macedonia, but all we can say for sure is that he spent three formative years in the household of leading members of Theban society. Tragedy struck in 368, as King Alexander II was assassinated during a festive war dance. Suspicion fell upon Ptolemy of Aloris, since it was he who benefited the most from Alexander's murder. With Philip's other brother Perdiccas too young to rule, Ptolemy installed himself as regent. Whether or not he took the title king, we don't know, but he was in all respects the ruler of Macedon. It was at this point that a distant relative of Philip, Pausanias, decided to stake his claim as king, and with a mercenary army he began to march on Pella, the capital of Macedonia. Ptolemy wasn't sure he could rely on the Macedonian army, so he chose diplomacy. He called on an Athenian commander, Ephicrates, who was in the area trying to re-establish Athens' control of the city of Amphipolis. Ephicrates combined his forces with Ptolemy and drove Pausanias off for the time being. In 365, Ptolemy was assassinated, either by Perdiccas or by someone working on his behalf, and Philip's second brother rose to power as the sole ruler of Macedon. Perdiccas struck a deal with Thebes, snubbing Athens, and as part of this agreement, Philip was finally freed from his years of captivity. After three long years, Philip returned home at the age of 17, ready to reclaim his place in the kingdom. But with Perdiccas now firmly in control, Philip's future remained uncertain. Would he be welcomed as a trusted ally or seen as a potential threat? In the year 360, a large army of Illyrians stormed into Molossia, a neighboring kingdom to Macedonia. Despite the valiant efforts of the Molossians, they were no threat to the invaders. The Illyrians were led by King Bardilus. He was almost 90 at this time, which is almost too incredible to believe, but he was still a formidable figure and could call on a large number of warriors. 
Bardilis now set his sights on Upper Macedonia, and Perdiccas rallied his forces to confront the invaders. In the late summer of 360, or possibly the spring of 359, a bloody battle took place. The details of the battle aren't clear, but what we do know is that the Macedonians suffered a catastrophic defeat. King Perdiccas was killed in battle, becoming the first known Macedonian monarch to fall to an enemy sword, and an estimated 4,000 of his soldiers perished with him. Although Perdiccas did have a son, he was too young to take the throne, so Philip was installed as leader. Initially, this may have been as a regent. It's possible, though, that he was declared King of Macedon from this moment. We simply don't have detailed records of how he became king. Macedonia was still weak upon Philip's ascension, and the new king was faced with four dire threats. The first and greatest threat was that of Bardilus, who was still occupying Upper Macedonia. The second threat was that of the Paeonians, another tribe who were pushing into Macedonian territory from the east. Then there were two potential usurpers who were aiming for the throne itself. One of the usurpers we've already met, Pausanias. He had already been beaten once by Ptolemy, but he saw this chance to become king once again, and he leapt at it. The other pretender was a man named Argeus, who was also a distant relative of Philip's. Philip was now in charge of a kingdom that was on the verge of being dismembered. He took stock of his situation, and the weakness of Macedonia upon Philip's ascension cannot be overstated. Philip began his reign by calling a council of Macedonian notables. According to Diodorus Siculus, quote, bringing together the Macedonians in a series of assemblies and exhorting them with eloquent speeches to be men. He was courteous and sought to win over the multitudes by his gifts and his promises." End quote. The king then began the process of consolidating his power and reforming the army for confrontation with the enemies of Macedonia. The military machine that Alexander would use to sweep across the world was still a ways off, but the transformation of Macedonia from a backwater into a superpower started at this time. Philip began by introducing new tactics and equipment. The Macedonians still had a Homeric vision of warfare, where individual courage and prowess were prized. While living with the southern Greeks, Philip saw firsthand how devastating a cohesive fighting force could be. He transformed the standard Macedonian infantry unit into a phalanx, but one that was unlike anything seen in the south. Instead of relying on armored spearmen who were capable of fighting as individuals, Philip issued a new weapon, the sarissa, a pike some 16 to 18 feet long, which was held in both hands. It had a large iron spear point and, crucially, a heavy counterweight on the butt, allowing it to be held far back so that most of the weapon projected in front of the man welding it. Due to its size, you couldn't use it with the large and heavy hoplon, typically used by Greek hoplites. This was replaced with a smaller shield, no more than two feet in diameter, which was strapped to the left arm and shoulder. The standard Macedonian phalanx was eight ranks deep. The men in the ranks behind the fifth angled their pikes forward and up to offer some amount of protection against thrown missiles. The mere approach of this phalanx, with its hedgehog of glittering spearheads, was itself intimidating. In the second century BC, one experienced Roman commander described it as the most terrifying thing he had ever seen. Now that Philip was confident in his new army's ability, he decided now was the time to go on the attack. His first target would be the usurper, Argeus. The city of Amphipolis had thrown off Athenian domination more than 70 years previous with the help of Sparta. However, they still coveted their former colony. Athens decided to back Argeus in his bid for the Macedonian throne, but Philip saw that the city of Amphipolis was their real goal. Backing the pretender was merely a means to this end, so he decided to weaken their resolve. Philip recalled the garrison sent to Amphipolis by his brother and declared that the city was autonomous. He reasoned that if he renounced any Macedonian claim to Amphipolis and Argeus succeeded in becoming king, he would not be in a position to hand over the city to Athens since Macedonia no longer possessed it. 
In 359, an Athenian expedition landed in their allied city of Methany on the coast of Macedon. This was a force of 3,000 hoplites, led by a man named Mantius. Argeas met them there, bringing his own mercenary army. They divided their strength. The majority of the Athenian force stayed with their commander in Methany, while Argeas advanced with his own army, along with some Athenian observers. He led them to the city of Agai, which was one of the capital cities of Macedonia. He probably left the main force behind to obscure the fact that he was relying on foreigners. Arriving outside the city, he declared himself king and hoped that the locals would come out to acclaim him. They did not. Whether from trust or affection from Philip, dislike of Argeas, or just doubts about his chance of success. Argeas retreated, but due to their forced march, his men were tired and dispirited. By now, word had reached Philip of the pretender's acclamation, and now it was Philip's turn to move quickly, and he mustered his army and force-marched them to meet Argeas. They fought a battle, which was in actuality more of a large skirmish, and Philip defeated the pretender. Even if it wasn't a famous battle, it was Philip's first victory on the battlefield, and it was a large psychological boost for the Macedonians. The Athenians that were present were spared, and Philip allowed them to return to Methany. Argeas, along with any Macedonian present, weren't so fortunate, and they were promptly executed. Mantius had tried to take the city of Amphipolis by storm, but failed. One down, three to go. Philip next turned to deal with the other pretender, Pausanias. He was being backed by the Thracians. A very formidable king named Cotys had recently united many of the Thracian tribes, but he had recently died. Philip knew that a succession war loomed, and since they would be distracted, he simply bribed one of the princes to stop backing Pausanias. This prince was more interested in Philip's gold and didn't want to risk outright war on the pretender's behalf in the hope of gaining plunder and influence. Pausanias vanishes from the sources at this point, so the deal was likely sealed with his death. Two threats down, two to go. Like most great leaders, Philip was also lucky. Early in his reign, he'd been forced to buy peace from the Paeonians, but their leader had also died at an opportune time for Macedon. He realized that they would also be preoccupied by a succession crisis, so he mustered the Macedonian army and marched against the leaderless Paeonians. He defeated them in battle and forced their leaders to swear allegiance to him. Philip had now dealt with three of the four threats to the Macedonians. Now there was only one challenger left, who was also the most formidable. In 358, Philip once again summoned the Macedonian notables and made a grand speech promising glory and victory when they met Bardilus and the Illyrians in battle. He marched at the head of an army of 10,000 infantry and 600 cavalry. By now, it was Bardilus who wanted to talk. He sent a proposal to Philip that each monarch could have peace on the precondition that they would hold on to whatever territory they currently controlled. Philip rejected the offer outright. He demanded that the Illyrians leave Macedonian territory immediately or prepare for battle. Bardilus, in turn, gathered his forces. He had a comparable army of 10,000 infantry and 500 cavalry. The Illyrians were famous for their loud war cries that would usually intimidate the Macedonians. Some ancient commentators claimed that you could tell the outcome of a battle by listening to the shouts raised by each side, but this ability alone wouldn't save them. The Macedonian infantry were formed with the royal bodyguard on the right. Philip advanced, ordering his cavalry to sweep around the Illyrians' flanks. Bardilus' cavalry isn't mentioned, which suggests they dismounted and fought on foot. Seeing the threat of encirclement, Bardilus pulled his men back until they formed a large, hollow square. Diodorus tells us that the battle was hard fought and that the combat swayed back and forth for some time, with heavy casualties on both sides. Even Philip's best troops were not especially experienced, while the Illyrians were confident of beating the Macedonians once again. The side most able to hold on and keep going forward to renew the fight was most likely to win. Philip and the companion cavalry fought well, and after some time, his cavalry managed to break into Bardilus's square formation. 
This was no mean feat in an era when horsemen were not expected to defeat determined men on foot in a head-to-head -head encounter. Fatigue and the continued aggression of the Macedonians meant that this time it was the Illyrians who started to give way. And once the formation was broken, it quickly dissolved into panicked flight. Diodorus claims that 7,000 Illyrian warriors died in the battle or in the pursuit afterwards. The square formation will have made it harder than usual for men to escape once the army collapsed. Showing a similar understanding of how things were done, Bardillus sent envoys to beg for peace. Philip reclaimed all the lost territory of Upper Macedonia as the price of granting it. This was a major victory against a truly formidable opponent, and although we know of the successes to come, we shouldn't forget that Philip had taken a big gamble. For the moment, all the pretenders were defeated or in exile, and the immediate threats had been beaten off. In the process, Philip had begun to recover lost regions and assert his dominance over neighbors. He'd survived his first crisis, but Philip still had a lot of work to do to transform Macedonia into the superpower of the ancient world. In 358 BC, King Philip II was riding high. He had just won a resounding victory over Macedonia's most bitter rival in Illyria, King Bardyllus. However, with a kingdom to build and more enemies on the horizon, Philip still had his work cut out for him. The king expanded his borders to reincorporate all of Upper Macedonia, which included some Illyrian-speaking communities. The Macedonians were starting to resemble a multilingual empire, and the military turned into a tool of social transformation. Philip had proved that he had some ability as a military commander, but these gains were not guaranteed to last, and the 24-year-old monarch knew it. Philip realized that now was the time for diplomacy. To solidify his recent victories, he managed to arrange five marriages over the course of the next three years. This was marriage as policy, not for love, although it's possible that Philip felt some affection for some or all of his wives. One of his wives, Audita, gave Philip a daughter, Sinane, who became a warrior and led an army into battle after the death of Alexander. Another wife gave him a son named Philip Aridaeus, who would later become important but was also mentally handicapped. The most important of his wives was a woman named Olympias, the mother of Alexander the Great. After consolidating his recent gains, Philip turned his attention back to strategy. Macedonia had a long-running conflict with Athens, and the king knew that he had to secure his coastline from invasion. Philip decided he had to take the city of Amphipolis in 357. The city's defenses were nearly impenetrable, and they had access to the sea, which made the city easy to resupply. Standard practice at this time was to surround the target city and starve the inhabitants, but this wouldn't work if Amphipolis had access to the sea. Defying convention, Philip decided to launch a direct assault on the city. He recruited a large corps of engineers and brought in a large amount of artillery. The defenders put up a fierce resistance, and the siege became a contest of wills. Eventually, it became clear that the city would fall. The citizens of Amphipolis, desperate to save their city, sent two envoys to the city of Athens and begged for help from their old enemy. Athens decided against war with Philip and instead sent two ambassadors to negotiate with him. He gave vague assurance of peace to the Athenians. As the summer wore on, Philip's battering rams finally took down a section of the city wall. The Macedonians stormed into the city. The Greeks expected the fall of a city to be accompanied by massacres, rape, and the enslavement of the survivors. Philip shocked everyone, though. Even if the siege was brutal, once he had possession of the city, he was unusually lenient. Those who led the opposition were exiled, but those who remained were safe, and they were allowed to keep their property. The city was absorbed into Philip's kingdom, but was allowed to function on a day-to-day -day basis under its own laws and institutions. Philip's growing power was starting to unnerve his neighbors. The Illyrians, led by King Grabus, were preparing to return to war with Macedonia. They were joined by the Paeonians, led by King Lypaeus. Another man named Sintriparus, who controlled a third of the Thracian tribes, saw his chance to strike a decisive blow and joined with the other two to form a triple alliance against Philip. 
Philip sent Parmenio, a trusted friend and general, with an army to confront the Illyrians, Macedonia's deadliest foe. The king took the rest of his forces south to lay siege to the city of Potidia to fulfill his agreement with the Chalcidians. This was a city that had withstood a two-year blockade by Athens during the Peloponnesian War, so this would be no easy feat. After a year of triumphs, it was said that Philip received three messages in a single day. The first message brought news of Parmenio's triumphant defeat of the Illyrians. The second was to announce the victory of Philip's horse at the Olympic Games. The third message he received would change the course of history, the birth of a son named Alexander. In just a few years as king, Philip had doubled the size of his kingdom and increased its wealth substantially. The days of fighting with his back against the wall were now behind him, and it was clear that a new age was dawning in Greece. Eventually, Philip found himself drawn into what's known as the Third Sacred War, which was a pan-Hellenic conflict which involved multiple city-states. One of the main combatants was the city of Larissa. Since he had an alliance with Larissa, Philip knew intervention in the conflict would be necessary to secure his reputation for reliability. Even though the potential gains were significant, there isn't any evidence that Philip had a deeper plan for the domination of Greece. The war isn't well known or documented, but it was an important event in Philip's life, so we'll recount it as best as we can. In ancient Greece, there was an association called the Delphic Amphictyonic League, a pan-Hellenic religious organization which governed the most sacred site in Greece, the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. In 357, it was the city of Thebes who dominated the league, and they wanted to punish the city of Phokis for past transgressions. They imposed a large fine on the Phokian confederation for the crime of cultivating sacred land. For good measure, Thebes also levied a fine on Sparta for occupying their city some 25 years previous. The Thebans knew that the fines were unjustifiably harsh and figured that when Phokis refused to pay, they would be justified in launching a sacred war against them. The Phokians held a conference to decide their course of action. Philomelus advocated a policy of seizing Delphi and asserting the ancient claim of Phokis to the presidency of the Amphictyonic League. This way they could use their newfound power to annul the fines on themselves. The Phokians voted in favor of this proposal, and Philomelus was appointed strategos autocrator, or general with independent powers, by the confederacy. His closest supporter, Onomarcos, was appointed strategos, second in command. The strategos knew that he couldn't conscript all of Phokis to fight, and decided to build a large mercenary army. In July of 356, he marched on the city of Delphi, taking the sanctuary of Apollo. Philomelus got to work securing his position in Delphi. He destroyed the stones which recorded the verdict against the Phokians and abolished the government of the city. He ordered the sanctuary to be fortified and a large limestone wall was constructed. He then sent emissaries to all the Greek states, asserting the Phokian claim to Delphi. The oracle had over time accumulated vast treasuries, but Philomelus promised not to touch this wealth if his claim was recognized. The Spartans endorsed his claim, since their fine had been annulled. Athens also expressed support, given their general anti-Theban foreign policy. Elsewhere, his emissaries were met with failure. The Thebans sent out their own envoys, suggesting that a sacred war be declared against Phokis. Most states supported this position, and the war was called. It was too late in the year to start a campaign, but promised that the following year the war would commence. On hearing the news, Philomelus was aware that he needed a substantially larger force, so he hired more mercenaries. The only way he could do this would be to plunder the accumulated wealth of Apollo. It is estimated that the Phokians spent some 10,000 talents of Apollo's treasure during the war. Philomelus had to increase the pay of the soldiers by half in order to overcome their reluctance to fight for a sacrilegious cause. The next year, Philomelus made the decision to go on the attack. His rationale was that if he could defeat the various armies assembling against him one by one, he stood a much higher chance of victory. 
Eventually, the Amphictyonic army, led by Philip's old Theban host Pamenes, defeated Philomelus on the slopes of Mount Parnassus. The survivors tried to escape up the mountain, and Philomelus himself was injured. Rather than risk capture, he threw himself off the mountain, falling to his death. Onomarcos, who was second in command, managed to salvage the remainder of the army and retreated back to Delphi. Pamenes, believing the Phocians had no choice but to sue for peace, returned to Thebes. Rather than surrender, Onomarcos rallied the Phocians, and they decided to continue the fight. The stakes were as high as they could possibly be, since nothing less than total victory would secure their future. His position secure, Onomarcos had his chief opponents arrested and executed and confiscated their property to add to his war chest. He doubled the size of his army to 20,000 men and 500 cavalry. The war ignited old rivalries in Thessaly, and the city of Larissa appealed to Philip of Macedon to help them defeat their old nemesis in the city of Pherae, who had sided with Phocis, and so Philip marched his army into Thessaly intent on attacking Pherae. Onomarcos received word of Philip's arrival, marched his own army into Thessaly to meet him, and actually inflicted two defeats on Philip. After these setbacks, Philip retreated to Macedonia for the winter. He is said to have commented that he did not run away, but like a ram, I pulled back to butt again harder. Philip returned to Thessaly the next summer with a new army. He requested that the Thessalians join him this time around. Philip now had an army of 20,000 infantry and 3,000 cavalry, roughly equal to the army of Onomarcos. Athens, sensing an opportunity to weaken Philip, sent an army under the command of Cares to aid the Phocians. Onomarcos marched to meet Philip once again, and the two armies met in the city of Pegasae. Philip sent his men into battle wearing crowns of laurel, the symbol of Apollo, as if he was the avenger of sacrilege, and he proceeded to battle under the leadership, as it were, of the god. The Battle of Crocus Field, as it became known, was one of the deadliest battles in ancient Greece. Philip won a decisive victory against Onomarcos. In total, 6,000 Phocian soldiers were killed, including Onomarcos, and another 3,000 taken prisoner. In the aftermath of the battle, the Thessalians elected Philip as Archon of Thessaly. Uniquely in ancient Greek history, the Phocians were able to absorb huge losses in manpower due to their plundering of Apollo's treasure. Even after their loss, the Phocians elected to continue the war and they regrouped under the leadership of Onomarcos' brother, Phalos. The war would continue for a couple more years, but Philip wouldn't involve himself in this phase of the conflict. However, it was clear that the sacred war could only be ended by outside intervention, since the Phocians had occupied several Boeotian cities, but they were starting to run out of treasure to pay their mercenaries. The king of Macedonia knew he would have to end the war, but he would only do so on his terms. Philip first had to secure a peace, or at least a truce, with Athens. They and Macedon had been at war since 356, and their bilateral war had been engulfed by the Sacred War. The Athenians were also hard-pressed, and it was they who initiated peace talks with Philip, and they sent an embassy to discuss peace with him. This embassy was composed of ten leading Athenians, including Philocrates, Demosthenes, and Aeschines. Philip received them graciously, and both sides presented their terms for peace. The emissaries returned to Athens to present the proposed terms, along with the Macedonian diplomats, empowered by Philip to finalize the agreement. On the 23rd of April, the Athenians swore to the terms of the treaty in the presence of the Macedonian ambassadors. After agreeing to the peace terms with the ambassadors, the Athenians dispatched a second embassy to Macedon to extract the peace oaths from Philip. They traveled at a relaxed pace to Pella, knowing that Philip was away on campaign in Thrace. When they arrived, the Athenians were surprised to find embassies from all the principal combatants in the sacred war present in order to discuss settlement in the war. When Philip returned to Pella, he received the Athenians along with the other embassies. They formed two groups. On one side were the Thebans, along with the Amphictyonic League. The other side consisted of Phocis, Athens, and Sparta. 
Philip heard both sides. He didn't commit to one side or the other, but promised both sides that he was strongly considering their proposal. Philip, meanwhile, was mustering his army. He told the ambassadors that this army would be directed at Hallas, a small Thessalian city which held out against him. He departed for Hallas without taking any oaths, forcing the Athenians to travel with him. Only when he reached Pherae did Philip finally take the oaths, enabling the Athenians to return home. It was now that Philip applied the coup de grace. He had secretly sent a small force to garrison Thermopylae, the only pass into southern Greece. By the time the Athenians were home, Philip was in possession of the pass. Now all of central and southern Greece was at Philip's mercy, and Athens couldn't save Phocis even if they abandoned the peace treaty. The Athenians realized their position was hopeless, and passed a motion reaffirming the peace treaty. Philip dictated terms to the rest of Greece. Phocis was surrendered to him, and in turn Philip announced that he would not sit in judgment of the city, but instead the Amphictyonic League would pass that sentence. The terms imposed on Phocis were harsh, but not as harsh as some other cities wanted. The city of Phocis was to be demolished, the people to be resettled in unwalled cities of no more than 50 houses each. The money stolen from the temple was to be repaid at the rate of 60 talents per year. Lastly, their two votes in the Amphictyonic League were stripped and handed over to Macedon. The Athenians were not punished, since Philip signed a separate treaty with them, and Sparta got off lightly. Philip presided over the Amphictyonic festival in the autumn, and to the surprise of many Greeks, returned to Macedonia and did not return to Greece proper for seven years. He did, however, garrison Nicaea, the closest town to Thermopylae. Philip had not yet turned 40, and he was on the precipice of controlling all of Greece. The scale of his achievements shouldn't be downplayed just because we know what comes after his death. He had accomplished more by this time than any other Macedonian, and his kingdom was looking more secure by the day. He had two sons by this point, one of them being the future conqueror of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Macedonia was now more powerful than it had ever been and King Philip II was unmatched by any Argiad in living memory. The kingdom, however, had always been unstable, and it was still possible everything could unravel. But Philip was increasing his hold over Macedon, and by extension, the entire Greek world. His son Alexander was growing into a formidable young man, giving the king even more security. Alexander was raised as a typical Macedonian prince, learning how to hunt and fight, Leonidas, his tutor, was a hard taskmaster who believed in tough love. In later life, Alexander joked that his tutor's idea of breakfast was a night march and for supper a light breakfast. Alexander's most famous childhood story is about the taming of the horse Bucephalus. A Thessalian merchant brought the magnificent stallion to Philip's court, but the horse refused to be controlled and seemed unbreakable. While Philip thought it was not worth buying, Alexander was convinced that they were losing a great horse because they didn't know how to handle him properly. He challenged his father, stating that he could tame the horse. He offered to pay the full price of the horse, 13 talents, if he failed. Alexander noticed that Bucephalus was scared of his own shadow, so he turned him directly into the sun so that shadow was no longer visible. Alexander soothed the horse and slowly mounted it. Little by little, he drew in the bridle and began a trot, and then eventually a full gallop. Philip looked on in stunned silence, shedding tears of joy, and said, O oh, my son, look thee out a kingdom equal to and worthy of thyself, for Macedonia is too little for thee. Philip was on campaign for most of his adult life, and the mid-340s proved no different. During this time, he was back in Illyria and brought most of it under his control. Thrace suffered the same fate. Philip's activities greatly alarmed the Athenians. They thought of that region as their sphere of influence. In 340, a group of notables from the city of Amphissa took their grievances against Athens to the Amphictyonic Council, accusing them of committing sacrilege by improperly rededicating spoils from the Persian War at Delphi. 
the Amphissians demanded a symbolic fine of 50 talents, since they were confident in Theban support. The Athenians rejected this demand outright and instead launched a countersuit on Amphissa, accusing them of desecrating sacred land that belonged to Apollo. The council decided to investigate these claims, and they turned out to be true, and this led to yet another sacred war being called, this time against Amphissa. The Thessalians proposed that Philip should be made leader of the Amphictyonic army, which gave Philip a legitimate reason to intervene, so he mustered his army and marched south. Philip's lenient treatment of Phocis in the previous sacred war now bore fruit. He reached Alatia and ordered the city to be repopulated, and during the next few months the whole Phocian confederation was restored. While the road to Athens lay open, Philip only had part of his army with him and wasn't in a position to attack the city. Instead, he sent ambassadors to Thebes to negotiate for peace. When this news reached Athens, the city went into full panic. When the Athenian assembly was called to emergency session, nobody would step forward to speak. Finally, Demosthenes, the great enemy of Philip, did so. Demosthenes gave the speech of his life, urging the Athenians to fight and calling for an alliance with Thebes. His speech was met with thunderous applause, and they approved of his plan. A group of ten envoys, including Demosthenes himself, was sent to Thebes. But Philip's envoys were already there, promising the Thebans a share of the spoils to come from their inevitable victory over Athens. Undeterred, Demosthenes stood before the Theban assembly and called for their courage and loyalty. Demosthenes' oratorical abilities may have persuaded the Thebans, along with Athenian promises to foot the bill, and an alliance between Thebes and Athens was formed. Philip now found himself facing a formidable alliance of the two most powerful city-states in Greece. By the summer of 338, Philip had gathered some 30,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry. He was still in no hurry to provoke a massed battle, especially by attacking the good defensive positions chosen by the main Athenian and Theban forces. The two armies were camped a mile or so apart near Coronia in early August 338 BC. The Allied army had an estimated 30 to 50,000 men. On the Macedonian side, Philip had command of the right flank and placed his son Alexander in command on the left flank, accompanied by a group of Philip's experienced generals. It's thought that on the Allied side, the Athenians were on the left flank, opposite Philip, and the Thebans on the right, opposite Alexander. This is because Diodorus recounts that the young Alexander, eager to prove himself to his father, was the one to lead the charge against the Thebans. He faced the sacred band and destroyed them. In the aftermath of the battle, both Athens and Thebes scrambled to rebuild their city walls in anticipation of a siege. Philip had other plans, though. He was far-sighted and knew that securing a permanent peace was preferable to outright humiliation of the defeated. The king was more concerned about gaining the support of all of Greece for his planned invasion of Persia. He first marched to Thebes, which surrendered to him. The Athenians again were treated very leniently. The Second Athenian League was dissolved, but they were allowed to keep their colony on Samos. Despite his growing power, Philip was not content to simply dominate Greece. He had grander ambitions in mind. In late 338 or early 337 BC, representatives from all Greek states were invited to meet with Philip at Corinth. The resulting treaty and alliance, known as the League of Corinth, established a representative council and a peace treaty among all Greek states. In the first council gathering, Philip proposed a bold idea to unite against Persia and punish them for their destruction of Greek shrines during their invasion in 480 to 479 BC. This proposal was approved, and Philip was elected as the leader with supreme authority to do as he saw fit. In the spring of 337 BC, Parmenio, Philip's most trusted and reliable subordinate, led an advance guard across to Asia Minor, and the war against Persia began. Philip planned to follow a year later with the main army. It was at this time that Philip sowed the seeds of his own downfall. In the aftermath of him becoming hegemon of Greece, Philip decided to take on a seventh wife. 
Her name was Cleopatra, the daughter of Hippostratus, and niece of a Macedonian general named Attalus. The problem was that Cleopatra was a noble, full-blooded Macedonian, and if she gave birth to a son, it could threaten Alexander's position, since he was only half Macedonian. Tensions were brought to a head at a feast to celebrate the union, where Attalus, Cleopatra's uncle, made a toast that seemed to suggest that Alexander was illegitimate and therefore unworthy of the Macedonian throne. Alexander reacted swiftly, throwing his cup at Attalus and demanding to know whether he was being called a bastard. Philip, who was drunk and incoherent, attempted to intervene but only made matters worse by stumbling and falling flat on his face. Alexander taunted him, saying, The man who wishes to conquer Asia can't even cross a room. A brutal episode ensued, involving Cleopatra's uncle Attalus and a jilted lover named Pausanias, which changed everything before the expedition departed. Pausanias was once Philip's lover, but the king eventually discarded him for a new favorite. Philip's new lover was also confusingly named Pausanias, who we'll call Pausanias too. This Pausanias was eager to prove his manhood and got his chance to do so in battle when he sacrificed himself to save the life of Philip. However, Pausanias too was a close friend of Attalus, and Attalus blamed Pausanias I for his friend's death and sought revenge for the death of his friend. During the winter of 337 to 336 BC, Attalus threw a party in which he invited Pausanias I and got him severely drunk. Then Pausanias was severely beaten and possibly, how can we say this politely, taken advantage of by a number of different men. Pausanias took his grievance to Philip, but the king was hesitant to punish his pregnant wife's uncle, a man he had just named co-commander of the advance guard. Hoping to placate Pausanias, Philip promoted him to be one of the seven royal bodyguards. To secure his western flank, Philip married off his daughter Cleopatra to Alexander of Epirus. He would use the wedding and accompanying festival to celebrate his success and popularity, and guests from all over Greece were welcomed to Macedonia. The opening procession was a grand spectacle, with statues of the twelve Olympian gods parading through the streets of Agai, the Macedonian capital. These were followed by a statue of Philip himself, who had won the favor and approval of the gods. Philip had carefully orchestrated his entrance into the theater, waiting until the perfect moment to appear with his son Alexander and Alexander of Epirus by his side. The cheers of the crowd echoed around the theater as Philip basked in the adulation, a moment that seemed to encapsulate all that he had achieved. While Philip was basking in his moment of greatest triumph, standing alone center stage, Pausanias, the disgruntled ex-lover, broke away from the rest of the bodyguards and dashed toward the king. He produced a dagger, which he thrust into Philip's side. The king fell to the ground and was dead within seconds. The assassin, pursued by his fellow bodyguards, made a desperate attempt to escape on horseback, but he tripped and fell and was caught and killed. The motive for Pausanias' actions remains a matter of debate, but in all likelihood he acted out of personal revenge. Within hours of the previous king's death, Antipater acted decisively and proclaimed Alexander as the new king of Macedonia. The scale of Philip's success was unprecedented. His son would carve out a vastly greater empire, and his deeds are described far more fully, while so much of what Philip did must remain a mystery. There was surely far more to Philip's reign than we can now reconstruct. But what we cannot doubt is that without Philip, the story of Alexander would be very different. And that's it for the incredible reign of King Philip II of Macedon. In the next episode, we will discuss the early years of the reign of Alexander the Great. Stay tuned.